And Father, once again, we come before you and say thank you for the mighty sacrifice that Christ did for us all those years ago. We have been singing about it this morning, and we declare that your grace is sufficient and that we can do all things through you. And so, Father, today I pray that you'll empower your church to be your church in this generation, to be on mission every moment, to know that the love and the light of Christ flows through us as believers. As we have joined with you in this covenant and desire to be in the presence of the Father, allow the light of Christ to flow through your church into the communities that we live, into the places where we work, into the schools where we school. Father, I pray that your glory and your light and your love and your grace will flow through us. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. And now as we turn our hearts to the word of God, I pray that you'll open our ears so that we could hear. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to invite Nadine up to use Melchizedek's name. Or you can just go with Mel if you want. We can do that, Nadine. So Hebrews chapter 7, if you've got your Bibles there, you might like to open to verse 1. This morning's reading is from Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. He was the king of peace because the name of the city he ruled as king was Salem, which means peace. And he was also a priest of the most high God. Now when Abraham was returning from defeating many kings in battle, Melchizedek went out to meet him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of everything he had won in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. This Melchizedek has no mother or father and no record of any ancestors. He was never born and he never died, but his life is a, like a picture of the Son of God a king priest forever. This is the word of the Lord. How do you feel about a guy who had no parents? Am I serious? Is that what you said? Mysterious. Mysterious. <laughs> I thought, wow, I'm going to be challenged this morning. Are you serious? <laughs> Could be a challenging message. I get challenged from the very first phrase. Melchizedek, it's a, it's a name that kind of rolls off your tongue. If you actually want to pronounce it uh, in the Hebrew, you've got to take all the vowels out. Try that. Imagine if I said that to Nadine. Just say it with no vowels. You, what? We need vowels in our words. But try and say Melchizedek and I'd just embarrass myself horribly by trying to do it without any vowels. But that's, that's his name. His name means righteousness. And he is the king of Salem, which means peace. Who would like to live in his kingdom? Who wouldn't like to live in his kingdom is more the story. And so he, in Hebrews chapter 7, it brings this mysterious, as Lily would say, guy by the name of Melchizedek back to our attention. And, and Hebrews actually picks up on this guy a fair bit. Now, if you want to know the story of Melchizedek, you've got to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 14. It's right back at the start of what we know as, as, as our humankind and our creation story. And you have this guy who is both the high king and a priest uh, of God. Now, why, why this is curious or mysterious, if I can use that word, is that Melchizedek wasn't a Jew. In fact, at that point, there were no Jews, which means there was no Moses, which means there was no law, which means there was no Ten Commandments. There was just Melchizedek, and he was the high king priest of the God Most High. Do you understand why this is a little anomaly in Scripture? So let's fast forward a few hundred years to get to Moses and we have God saying that priests and high priests are only going to come out of the tribe of Levi. That's what happened. They became Levites. They became people who served in the temple. Uh, they became the high priest. And it was only if you came from the tribe of Levi. Melchizedek didn't because Levi wasn't yet born. There were still two more generations before Levi would even get on the planet 
and then there would be another four or five hundred years before Moses would be on the planet for, he, for God to say it's only through Levi that priests are going to be. But we have this strange guy by the name of Melchizedek who was outside of Abraham, the Jewish nation, which didn't even exist at the point in time, and he's called the High King Priest of God. We okay with that? Jesus, 2,000 or 1,500 years later, uh, comes and he is not born of the tribe of Levi. He is born of the tribe of Judah. And so for anyone to think that Jesus was going to become a priest or a high priest and he's not a Levite, people are going, there is no way that's going to happen. It's not, it's not going to happen. Jesus can't be because he doesn't have the right credentials. He doesn't have the right ancestors. And he's not a Levite. And this is why the writer of Hebrews picks up on Melchizedek and Jesus as being so similar. They are not the normal way of doing things. So Melchizedek means righteousness. He rules a kingdom called peace. And you can see why he's connected with a person called Jesus, who is our righteousness and is the Prince of Peace. Yeah? We've heard scripture say that about Jesus, and that's who he is. And that's why the writer of Hebrews can connect Jesus' story with Melchizedek's story. His name means righteousness. Or if you've got another version, another translation, they will either use the word righteousness or justice. Why they do that is God's righteousness is given to us through Christ's sacrifice. His sacrifice was necessary so that we could be forgiven for our sins and God's justice could be appeased. And so now it is just for God to open up a pathway to him. Righteousness. For anyone here who has chosen to follow Jesus for all the days of their lives, you are righteous. It's something God gives to you. It's not something that I can bestow upon you. It's something that God gives to you. But here's a guy who became known as righteous. So when he came walking down the street, you had the righteous one walking down the street. He was righteous. There's a lot about a name, isn't it? I wonder if for a moment you could just think about the meaning of your own name. Does anyone here know the meaning of their own name? Anyone not know the name meaning? A few don't, right? Um, can I just explain to you how, how this works in, in Old Testament times? Um, your name could quite possibly change, depending on what you've just about to do or, or, or do. And so Jacob was born as Jacob, but he became then known as Israel. And that's where we got Israelites. Abraham was born as Abram, but God changed his name to Abraham, father of few to father of many. Sarah wasn't Sarah when she was born. She was Sarai. Try and say that with no vowels. Doesn't leave you with much, does it? And so you would get a name possibly later in life. In our culture, you get it on, you generally on the day that you're born. And if you come through a, a Catholic faith, you might get another name or you get to choose your name. Is that how it works? You get to choose your name when you come to a place of confirmation or Holy Communion, something like that. And generally you choose a name that you like, right? Because it sounds good. Yesterday I went and spoke at a church camp um, and uh, there's a girl there who's heavily pregnant and um, the doctors told her a while ago there's no way she can have kids uh, and she's 37 weeks pregnant, right? It's just beautiful. And I said, um, do you know what you're having? And she said, yeah, I'm having a boy. And I said, what's his name? And she said, well, Mateo. Uh, you know what that means, don't you? Do, you? do you know what that name means? Gift of God. I'm just saying. <laughs> but for her the name meaning meant more than the name and she is declaring over a child that was never meant to be born that this child is a gift from God right do you understand often our, our names are who we are but we become defined by what we carry. 
And so I just want to use a few people in the church as a bit of a, uh, an understanding of that. And I've only queued up with one of them so far, so um, bear with me. Uh, Ida means work. Now, how would you like that to be your definition of your name? <laughs> you might try the gift from God, right? Why? Yeah, we've got lame down the front here. But Ida means work. Now, I work with Ida. Ida doesn't see it as work. She sees it as service, which is a biblical statement of worship. And so I know what her name means, but I see how she uses her name to accomplish more than you can possibly imagine because she serves God in all that she does. And you get the benefit of seeing what she does. Does that make sense? So she is known as Ida, which means work, but her service is something so far greater because her service is her act of worship that she has to the Father in heaven. So the things that she does honours the Father in heaven. And before you know it, you have a woman who is named is yes, work, but the work actually looks like this. It looks like the kingdom. It looks like the beauty that she desires to pour into the kingdom. My own sister at the back there, her name is Laura, but the name Laura means to honour. To honour, it comes from the word for laurel. Like, you know, they used to wear a laurel when you were honoured because you were a victor uh, in, a, in the games or, or, or you had won a great ba- battle. And so Laura's name it means to honour. And I want to say to you, for, for probably a couple of decades, she's been honouring us by giving up her time and space, by saying, this is what I do, this is my service to God. And before you know it, we get caught up with the thing that is going on inside of her. And so when we hear her name, we can see the truth that that belongs to that name. Damien, do you know what your name means? It means to tame. You've done an awesome job. <laughs> Roseanne's just laughing. She, she's, she's been tamed, okay. <laughs> but this is the, the phrase, right? You can take these names negatively or positively, and brother, I know you. And so I believe it to be a positive statement over your life. Because I think for someone to be known as one who tames, it is one who is in a place of authority and the one who leads. Now I know what you do for a job and I know that you are a leader in your field because you have other people that you are raising up around you. You have registrars that you know that you are looking after and you are pouring into. When you transfer that to the kingdom of God, brother, you are going to be a person who disciples and leads people into the kingdom of God. Yeah? Can we declare that over Damien today? Are you okay if we could declare that over Damien today? Because that is who I believe him to be. I can hear his name. I understand what it means, but I want to show you what it looks like is what I'm saying. Rochelle, do you know what your name means? It means the same thing that Craig's name means. It means the same thing that Alan's name means. It means the same thing that Peter's name means. It is a rock. Now, I wonder if we could just stop for a minute and think we've got so many people who are known as rocks in this place. (laughs) Means we rock, right? (laughs) We okay with that? Can I say that? (laughs) But the concept is we have people of faith that the Lord is building his kingdom upon right here in this very room. That is what they have been called. That is how they are known. Now I want to show you how it looks. So Rochelle's life, is she is a counsellor and she is working with teens and youth. And I want to say to you, Rochelle, you are a woman who is a rock for many. And I have no idea how many people have sat in your office. I have no idea how many people you've encouraged and led along. But I want to say to you, I believe if I could talk to some of them, I would hear them say that you are a rock. Walk into who you are. Live out who you are. And discover the kingdom that is around you. So Melchizedek is known as the righteous one. He is the one who has found a pathway to God. And if you want to find a pathway to God, you hang out with people called Melchizedek. There's not many around. I've not found one. But I want to say as believers... Maybe our second names 
should be Melchizedek. Ida Melchizedek. <laughs> Jacques Mabono. <laughs> That's too long, right? There's not enough little boxes on those things you've got to fit. You know, believe me, when you've got a name as long as mine, you realise that. Why don't they make longer boxes, right? To be known as the righteous one is a reputation that he has gained. To know that he has a kingdom of peace. Like who wouldn't want to live in that place? So here's the story of Melchizedek. Uh, and just before that, in, in Genesis chapter 14, it seems that there is a season of battle that is going on and kings are trying to attack other kings and they're trying to take plunder, they're trying to take land, they're trying to take slaves, they're trying to take brides, they're trying to take all this sort of stuff. And it's like this chess game of chess that happens in the Middle East once a year, all those years ago. A very harsh way, or a very lighthearted way of saying something harsh in that, but you've got to understand the culture of the day to understand what's going on. Now, for whatever reason, Abraham missed all that. Didn't affect him. He's cool. He's protected. No one's attacked Abraham, but somebody has attacked his nephew by the name of Lot. Now, Lot has been living in a place called Sodom. Now, what has happened is kings have come and taken him captive, taken his family captive, and led him away. So what his future would probably look like is he would be sold into slavery to somebody else. He is worth money and somebody would pay money for somebody like that. If he was a man of significance, he could have been ransomed. So they could have come to Abraham and say, hey, I've got your nephew. What's he worth? Does that make sense? It's a ways of making money and investing into a fortune is by taking slaves and that way you take free people and you make them your own. And Lot had been captured. Now Abraham hears about that and he goes, you know what, we can't let that lie. And so the Bible says in, in Genesis chapter 14 that he gathers 318 men for battle. It's a peculiar number. 318. So here's the way the scripture handles those peculiar numbers. When something is as specific as that, it's usually because it's such a little number compared to what he's about to fight against. And so if you've ever felt overwhelmed, if you've ever thought that something is impossible, if you ever thought that you're just doing this because you have no idea or you, you know it's the right thing to do but you don't know what the outcome's going to be, you've stood in Abraham's shoes. And so he's gathered 318 men together and he's gone out to find Lot. Finds him, wins the battle. Lot and his family come home with Abraham and on the way back, on the journey back, Melchizedek comes out with his bottle of wine and his loaf of bread. And he invites Abraham to a feast and at the same time blesses Abraham. This is how he got his name. This is what Abraham does. And you can read it all there. Abraham sees Melchizedek on the road and stops and kneels. Kneels in front of him, so he submits before Melchizedek. Now remember, Abraham is the one who God has said, you are the father of many nations. My blessing is resting upon you. Through you, all nations will be blessed. You would think that Abraham has a significant authority in the kingdom if that was the case. He is the one who walks up to Melchizedek and kneels. What does that say to you about Melchizedek's authority? What does it say about Abraham and the way that he sees Melchizedek's life? He kneels and he gives him a tenth of everything. We call that a tithe. And right there in that place, Melchizedek offers a blessing. And a blessing that he speaks out is, is and you can read it, it talks about how the creator of heavens and the earth has been with you, Abraham, and he is the one who has given you that victory, Abraham, and I'm going to bless you in that guy's name. I'm going to bless you in his name. When was the last time you offered someone else a blessing other than when they sneezed? I'm not even sure if that's a blessing. Do you reckon you could bless the person right next to you right now? Just bless them, right? Just to say, today, I believe God's hands on your life. If you know their name and if you know what their name means, I want you to say thank you. Thank you for your service to the kingdom of God. Thank you that you are somebody that people can build their lives upon. Thank you. 
It's easy to offer a blessing when you get in the habit of being a blessing. So here is the king by the name of Melchizedek. And he has invited Abraham into a place of a feast where he's sharing with him his wine and his food. And it's just like when, and here's the thing, when righteousness and when peace and when the, the father of many nations actually start getting together, you actually start seeing the body of Christ work the way that it's supposed to work. Do you understand that? And this is the way I think when I saw this, I saw a picture of the church in that, that when we actually understand who we are and what we carry, when we get together, we start honouring people like we have been doing and all of a sudden a party breaks out. All of a sudden a feast breaks out. All of a sudden love breaks out. All of a sudden blessing breaks out. But you've got to understand who you are and what you carry. And so when you come into church, all of a sudden the blessing can start overflowing. And before you know it, we're actually working the way that we should be working. Another king joins them on the road. And this guy, we don't have his name, but we know him to be the king of Sodom. Now, do you know what the word Sodom means? Not many people do. It's a confusing word. If you go back through um, the, the, the textbooks and you go back through commentaries, you'll see that people have varying opinions on what Sodom actually means. And you get straight away an understanding of what's happening in Sodom. It's a confusing place. But here's what the word means. It means a secret, it means a hard place, and it means a scorched place. Now, would you rather live in the kingdom of peace or the kingdom of secrecy, hardness, and scorch? So the king of Sodom has been part of the people that took Lot captive. I want you to put in that context too. And so the king of Sodom has just been beaten, has just been dealt with. And he turns back up on the road. And he comes to Abraham and he demands from Abraham. So I want you to hear the difference. Melchizedek comes to the road with food and with wine and offers an invitation and gives to him a blessing. The king of Sodom, in his hardness and secrecy and being scorched, comes to, to Abraham in that place and demands something. And when I looked at that, I could see uh, parallels with how Jesus and Satan obviously impact our world and how Paul talks about the principalities of darkness that fight against us. In Jesus, he ha we have a person who invites and blesses. In Satan, we have a person who wants to demand and accuse. Do you hear what I'm saying in that? To demand and accuse. And so here's the king of Sodom who has been defeated. Let's put it in context. He comes onto the road from the one who defeated him and demands something from him. It was not his right to take back. He could ask for it, but he could not demand it. Often I find in my own Christian walk and my own Christian life, Satan wants to demand things from me. He demands that I look at my past. He demands that I stay in places of guilt or shame. He demands that I stay in places of fear. And it's until you actually take the authority that God has given to you and stand up over the oppressor and say to him, I will give to you what I choose to give to you, but I'm going to stand here in the authority that the one that has come to save me, and it's in that authority and that freedom that I declare that you are to go. So here's what Abraham does. Abraham looks at the king of Sodom and says, this is what I will do. Everything I've taken from you, I'm going to give it back because I don't, want to, I don't want anyone to know that I've got rich from anything that you've put into my life. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 14, it says this, even if I have a thread, you know those threads that just stick to your clothes? Abraham was not even willing just to have a thread, right? He must have been an OCD sort of guy. He just didn't want... Like, I don't know how that worked, but, but that's the thing. Like, he had not even a thread. And he says to the oppressor, he says, and he takes authority over him, and he says, this is what I am going to say. This is what I'm going to do. And from the demand, uh, the, we have Abraham stand up as the one who is in authority, and he declares what is going to happen, and he releases himself from anything that will associate him with the king of Sodom. Wouldn't that be cool as believers today? That we declare anything that Satan has over us, that we're just going to give it back. 
I don't, I don't want guilt anymore. I'm just going to give it back. I don't want shame anymore. I'm just going to give that back too. Could, could we do that? I'm not wanting to live in fear anymore. I'm just going to give that back to you. You can have that. I don't want to live in hardness anymore. You, you can have that back too. I'm not going to live in secrecy anymore. I'm going to give that back as well. Because when you get scorched, I don't want to be anywhere near you. Do you understand? Can you see the parallels? Here is one king who has come to you and invites and blesses. And you have another who has come to you and demanded to give back what he thinks is his. But as believers in Christ... You stand here and you sit here in the authority of the one who has come and saved you and is changing you and making you like himself. And so you can take your name and you can start living with it and you can understand what you are carrying. And before you know it, the people around you are going to start being affected by it. If you've got a king who is known as righteousness and he rules a kingdom of peace, he's got to be just leaking peace everywhere and people are coming to live in that place of peace. The king of righteousness, the king of peace, a priest of the God most high. I want to finish by saying this. A kingdom of righteousness or a kingdom of peace sounds nearly like a fairy tale, doesn't it? It's like when you see those kids shows of unicorns. You know, anyone seen the Lego movie? Who's seen the Lego? Eamon and Hamish have seen the, the Lego movie. It's, you know when they go up and it's just like this place of happiness you know and the little unicorn bounces around yeah. isn't it cool would you like to live up there yeah I'm with you I'm, I am with you 100% right I couldn't exist in that if like, I'm, I, when I go up there, you know when you watch that movie, you kind of feel like Batman, right? Remember what Batman is in that? He just can't exist in that kind of environment. There's just not enough. Um, but that's the thing. When we hear a kingdom of peace, we think it's like the little unicorn that's bouncing around and it becomes mythical, it becomes a fairy tale, which then we says is not achievable, so we just can't engage with that, we can't accept that. But the kingdom of peace is built on the journey of a life where he has discovered the grace of God in heaven. He has received the revelation of who he is. When he understands righteousness versus unrighteousness, when he understands what guilt and shame actually feels like, then he discovers what freedom is. And that happens when you have journeyed life. That doesn't just happen with a wave of magic wand and all of a sudden you are in the kingdom of peace and let's just suck on lollipops for the rest of our lives. That it happens when you have journeyed through dark valleys, when you understand what it looks like to walk through places that seem to be dark, but all of a sudden you have discovered that Jesus is beside you and you realise that in faith you have discovered this righteousness, this place that God exists and the place that you know that God is working through and before you know it, as you become righteous, the people around you start being sucked into that little vortex Because God is doing something within you that is actually what people want and not repelling people from them. And there is the king of righteousness that is building a kingdom of peace. Why? Because he has seen what the dark valley looks like and he has become known by what his faith actually looks like. And I want to call us into a place of allowing your kingdom to be a reflection of what you believe. I'm challenging myself in that as much as I am challenging us as a church in that. Because it's easy to be a kingdom of fear. It is easy to be a kingdom of failure. It is easy to be a kingdom of guilt. It is easy to be a kingdom of shame. I don't have to do anything and I can find those places. But faith has my head lifted to know that God is at work even within the darkest things of my journey and my life. And some days, I've got to say that to myself many times. I have to remind myself of why I believe, of what I carry, of who I am, and what it looks like when we're all together. Because what I want when we're all together is just a party. 
a feast, a place of enjoyment, a place where the kingdom of God is, a place where people who are going through dark valleys can come and find comfort and care, a place where people are sick can come and get prayer, a place where people are feeling pressed down in this life can come and have a shoulder, a place where Christ can be free to be who Christ is and that we can become known as a place of righteousness that is building a kingdom of peace. Who's up for that? You bunch of Melchizedeks. When one who serves meets one who is honourable, meets someone who can, we can build our lives upon, meets someone who can raise us up and grow us in the name of the kingdom, do you understand what the church actually looks like? It looks like an organism that's actually starting to work the way that it was always designed to work. I wouldn't have known what Damien's name was unless I asked Google the question. Nor Rochelle, nor Pete, nor Ida. Uh, you know what Trisha's name means? It means to be noble. And she is. She is. She has authority in the kingdom of God. And she is beautiful. I can say that uh, in all authority. I want to pray. And I want to call you into this place of the kingdom in the blessing of Melchizedek. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 14, just let me read to you Melchizedek's blessing over Abraham. He was known as Abram at the time. It says, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heavens and earth, and be blessed and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies. God has defeated your enemies, my friends. It is time now to be known for who we are and understand what it is we carry. I want you to stand up as we pray together. This morning in this room, Christ is again inviting and blessing. That's what he does. That's who he is. He invites and blesses. He doesn't demand. And he wants to give to you what you do not have. He wants to add into your life what only God can give. Righteousness and peace. And so in this place this morning, I encourage you to live out the authority of who you are and what it is you carry. That even if we look at our own earthly names and believe them to be a poor expression of who we are, may we take that earthly name and reverse it. Jacob was once known as a liar and deceiver. He becomes the leader of a nation. You don't get that by being a liar and a deceiver. Father, I pray that in this room this morning, that the truths that we've been talking about through the book of Hebrews, built one upon another, will continue to resonate and echo inside of our souls. That we have been created on purpose and we've been created for a purpose. And Father, you have given to us a name. You have placed on us Christ's name. And you are saying and through your scripture and through the reality of what we see that we are being transformed more and more into that name. And Father, we thank you for that is a work only you can do. It's not something we are prideful about or boast about. It's something, Father, that you are at work in. And so, Father, I just want to think of the man by the name of Melchizedek. And I know that he didn't walk in pride to gain those names. He must have walked a difficult valley to discover the greatness of who you are. And so, Father, we thank you for men like Melchizedek. We thank you, Father, for people like Pete, Pete right here in this room, for Rochelle, for Trish, for Ida, for Laura. Oh, Father, I just thank you for Damien. I thank you, Father, for each person here, for who they are and what they carry. 
And I pray, Father, that we again will be a church where the more we get together, the more the feast occurs. And when the feast occurs, the food which is your word will flow through us into the lives and hearts of many. So, Father, call us as a church to live out the destiny, Lord, that you have called us to. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, Father, we thank you that you are the King of Righteousness. You are and have the kingdom of peace. And I thank you, Father, that in your name is freedom. In your name there is life. In your name, Father, are the very things that we've been speaking and listening to. And we can join our story now with the kingdom that has been for thousands of years and declare, Father, we desire to live in that very place of peace and righteousness. So, Father, lead us and guide us through dark valleys. Grow us, Father, and open our eyes and ears to see what it is you are saying and calling us into. And, Father, may we be a church that is known as a place of righteousness, peace. May your blessing today, may God's blessing rest over Haberfield Baptist Church. May its blessing flow into a community. And may people come to know you as Lord and Savior.